Hi, and thanks for tuning in. For those that don't know me, my name is Steve Benninger. I'm a lifelong resident of South Spruce, and I'm also a fuel handling operator at the Bruce Power Nuclear Facility. I wanted to share a, sm a short video with everyone showing how we currently handle the fuel at the Bruce site and move it from wet storage to dry storage. The concerns with water safety are very valid. I have lived next to the Teeswater River for the last 25 years. I visit it almost daily. I have paddled it. I have swam in it. I have drank from it. I have fished in it. And I have spent time with my family and friends in it. You will have to take my word when I say I wouldn't endorse any project that I thought would affect the quality of these waters. I hope uh, everybody learns a little something. Thanks for watching. This is the secondary irradiated fuel bay. This is where fuel is moved from the primary irradiated fuel bay after a minimum of six months. It's larger than the primary fuel bay and the uh, fuel stays here for a minimum of 10 years before it goes into dry fuel storage containers. The glare that you see on the screen there is the reflection of the overhead lights on the uh, surface of the water. On the screen right now, you can see at the top right-hand side a full irradiated fuel tray. It's a tray that holds 24 irradiated fuel bundles. Below that, you can see an empty tray. Uh, the reason we have empty trays is because the trays do not go into the dry storage container. We have to move the bundles from the trays into what are called modules. And you can see a module on the left-hand side near the top of the screen right now. The module holds 96 fuel bundles and it is currently sitting on the machine that we use to transfer the bundles from the trays to the modules. The empty trays go back to the primary bay to be reused. There on the left hand side you can see several modules that are ready for loading into a dry storage container. There are currently approximately 330,000 irradiated bundles in the secondary bay at Bruce A. That represents about 15 years of station energy production. The water in the bay is approximately 28 feet deep. It is demineralized water and it aids in the removal of decay heat or latent heat from the fuel bundles, but it also provides excellent shielding. The instrument I am holding here measures gamma radiation and it measures in millirem per hour. It is currently reading 0.0, .0 millirem per hour, showing how effective the shielding or the water is at shielding the radiation. Rem and millirem per hour measures the effects of ionizing radiation on the average body type. Any number less than 2.5 millirem per hour is quite insignificant and we would not need to even post as a hazard anything that is reading less than 2.5 millirem per hour. In this shot, even though it's kind of dark, I am actually underneath the fuel bay. So those 330,000 bundles are directly above me right now. I am separated by about 5 feet of concrete. You can see there my gamma reading was 0.4 millirem per hour, which demonstrates the effectiveness of concrete as shielding. Here we are lifting a dry storage container without the lid installed, and we are going to put it into the fuel bay and load it with fuel. The container is just breaking the surface of the water now, and bay water is filling the cavity of the container. This container weighs about 70 tons when it is empty and uh, about 75 tons when it is full. We are now loading the first of four modules into the container. Each module, as I said earlier, holds 96 bundles. So after we add four of them into a container, we end up with 384 bundles in each dry storage container. Now that all four modules are loaded in the container, the lid can be installed. Here we are beginning to lift the lid along with the clamp that will clamp the lid and the container together during transport. We are maneuvering the lid and the lid clamp over top of the bay area and now we will lower it down and install it on the body of the container. The lid is now installed onto the body and the clamp has been locked into position and we now lift the entire container out of the water. 
as the container starts to break the plane of the water I'm measuring the gamma dose rate and as you can see it is virtually zero. The water shielding is now removed and we have replaced it with the concrete and steel shielding of the container itself. At this point there are only about two feet of concrete and a small sheet of steel separating me from the fuel bundles and we are still only registering very minimal numbers on the gamma gun. The container is now fully removed from the bay and you can see the drain valve that is installed on the bottom of the container is currently letting the water that was inside the container drain back into the bay. Something to keep in mind is this water, just because it has been exposed to the high gamma rates of the fuel, the water is not radioactive. Irradiating water with gamma radiation does not make the water radioactive. There is potential for radioactive particles to be present in this water and that is because there is some carryover from our heat transport system in the reactor to the fuel bay during the discharge of the fuel process. We leave the container hanging in this position for about 20 minutes while the majority of the water from inside the container drains back into the bay. The full container is now sitting on the floor and I'm currently standing at the drain hole opening. This is a two inch hole leading directly to the fuel bundles. You can see that I am reading again a very very low number on my gamma gun. Some people might wonder how is this possible. I am standing at a two inch opening two feet away from irradiated fuel bundles and registering no gamma. I think this is an important point for people to realize. Gamma radiation is not a physical substance like a liquid or a gas. It is an energy wave and like energy waves it travels in straight lines only. So think of it as sunlight. On a sunny day, light is all around you, but if you step around the corner of a building, you're in shadow. It's because these energy waves do not turn corners. This drain line has a couple elbows in it, meaning the gamma has no direct path straight out of the container. So when we talk about leakage from the DGR, remember this point. We only need to block the gamma radiation. We don't need to create a leak tight seal. I'm now looking at the top of the container, the top of the lid actually, and the clamp has now been removed. Again, this entire space around the perimeter of the lid is an opening, a direct opening to the fuel below inside the container. Again, it's not a straight path. Eventually, this area that you're looking at right now will be filled with weld when the lid is welded to the body. But there is a gap left for the weld gases to escape. So one could say that I'm currently standing at a leaking container in the sense that there are direct openings between me and the fuel bundles. I don't need any respiratory protection. I don't need any special protective equipment. If additional leakage was going to occur from the DGR, water would have to erode its way through the host rock, through the bentonite clay, through the copper coating, through the steel container, through the zircaloy sheath of the fuel bundles, and into the ceramic pellet. Massive amounts of water would be required to create this erosion path. The bundles themselves, just the zircaloy sheath on the bundle, is designed to reside in a reactor in 300 degrees Celsius water traveling at about 40 kilometers an hour in a very turbulent pattern and under, under a pressure of 10 megapascals. So the question that gets asked a lot is why can't the fuel stay where it is in the dry fuel storage container? That's a fair question. The fuel is very safe. We have to think about, about it though in a much grander time scheme than we are used to thinking about. We know for a fact that the surface of the earth has been changed and sculpted by major events throughout history. These include ice ages, asteroid hits, and probably some things that we're not even aware of. The area where the DGR is proposed has been untouched and unchanged, basically since the beginning of time. 
It is the only way that we can assure the future civilizations of this earth that it will be intact and left with no harm to our future. I'm very proud of the agricultural heritage of Bruce County. I'm proud of my agricultural background, but I'm also proud of the nuclear heritage of Bruce County. The development of Douglas Point was a paving ground for the future of nuclear in this country. It led to the establishment of Bruce A and Bruce B generating stations, which now comprise the world's largest nuclear facility. There were also protests about Douglas Point. Many of the arguments were the same as the arguments we're hearing today. What happened with those protesters? For the most part, they lived out their lives in the area and watched the community prosper. None of their dire predictions and warnings came true. And in some cases, their descendants went on to have careers in the nuclear industry. So what would have happened had the protesters been successful at stopping Douglas Point's construction? How would that have affected us? I guess I don't really know that answer, but I do know that my life and the lives of the tens of thousands of other people that have been employed in the nuclear sector in this area would be greatly impacted. Thanks a lot, and if anybody has any questions, please ask. Thanks so much. Have a great day.